All right, I, I think we're at about ready to start. And um, we are recording this tonight, and we'll be recording all of our speakers. So if you could turn off your cell phones, that would be awesome. Um, and I know there's a few people s filtering in. Feel free. There's one chair up front if anybody needs it. And there's one right there. Oh, there's Helen. Helen, there's a chair up front. Um, and there. OK. All right. Well, welcome, everybody, to the Large Pelagics Research Center Fish and Fishery Seminar Series. We've been running this series since 2006. And we're pleased to um, be hosted by Maritime Gloucester. Um, they, it's a beautiful venue, and they're great hosts. And we're very, very pleased that we were welcome to come back again and host this series. And I'd like to start out by um, pointing out that there's at least f four more highly accomplished marine scientists that will be following uh, tonight's seminar. Um, and they include Dr. Mo, Mo or Myra Brown, uh, Dr. Angela Vanderlan, our own scientist in the back, um, who'll be speaking about right whales. Dr. John Grabowski, who's a phenomenal um, a, a ground fish expert. Um, there's also Dr. Mike Jack, our collaborator, who is at the Northeast Fishery Science Center. He's the herring and acoustician expert. He's working with us on direct assessment, and he's got some amazing things to say. I'd also very much like to thank our sponsors this year. We no longer had the federal funds um, to run this program, so sponsors stepped up. So I'd like to thank Gorton's, um, the city of Gloucester. Um, we, we have uh, Boston Tuna and Sword, and of course, Maritime Gloucester for helping to host it as well. So thanks to them very much. And let me get this thing on. Um, so I encourage you to come back next Thursday and see what's up. So some of you have come to our previous seminars and have heard about our work on large pelagic species, particularly the bluefin tuna story. And tonight, I'm taking the chance to revisit some of our findings on bluefin, but to bring in some new players um, that are large pelagics. Um, you're going to hear about big eye and about sailfish, Atlantic sailfish. And I hope by having some of the details from our uh, more extensive work on bluefin tuna, you'll begin to have a taste of the kinds of basic biological and ecological information that we're learning about these species. And I don't have to tell you all that these are commercially and recreationally valuable. Some of them are at the center of controversies today. And um, I'm going to give you a taste of some of the players. Um, I didn't hear anybody laughing. Billy, where is he? He's not up there yet. Um, of course, we like to put ourselves in the role of the wicked tuna scientists. And um, all of our large pelagic scientists, grad students, postdocs, and staff have contributed to this. And I'd also like to thank our very important sponsors of our research. As our federal funds have diminished greatly, others have stepped up, including Cell Signaling, New England Biolabs, the Guy Harvey Ocean Foundation, and of course NOAA. So we very much are grateful to them for supporting this work. All right, let's get to the tunas. Everybody in this room that eats tuna knows that um, the species like bluefin, big eye, the swords, um, yellowfin, and albacore are all contributing to the diet of people around the world. The skipjack and the albacores that might be in the can that you ate when you were growing up are certainly a part of our diet. And then we also have the, let's call them the, the kings, the sushi fish, or toro, that's excited the palates of just about everyone around the world that can afford to eat them. And so these fish are also at the center of controversy over how many fish there are. Are they endangered? Are, they, do there, are their populations being fished sustainably? And so on. And so we played a role in delivering the scientific information that's needed to sort of get to the root question of how are the stocks doing? And it goes without saying that this work started in 1993 when the spotter pilots and fishermen that back then with East Coast tuna brought their observations that there were more bluefin tuna that they could see in single days in the Gulf of Maine than were being represented by stock assessments for Western bluefin. And so they basically bought the cameras and the laptops, and the New England Aquarium team, of which I was a part, then started our collaborative research that has continued since 1993. And 
And that work led to sonic tracking, satellite tagging, and then a whole bevy of PhD and MS student projects at the University of New Hampshire, where we migrated from. And that was in order to increase the productivity and to train young marine scientists on fisheries issues, particularly because here they had the opportunity to work with the experts in the business, and those would be the fishermen. So, um, here's some new players. This is a big eye. Um, you can see they're very recreationally valuable to fishermen on, out in the canyons. Uh, this picture happens to show um, a pop-up satellite tag that uh, these recreational fishermen from Salem, they recaptured this big eye that, that had been tagged by our partner, um, uh, the Eagle Eye 2, which is a longliner. That tag had been on that tuna for 10 months. It was programmed to pop off after a year, but happily we recovered the tag. They got the reward, and we got a whole great data set um, from on Big Eye Tuna. And you're going to hear a bit more about that, but fishermen of both commercial and recreational genres have contributed to our bluefin science and our tuna science. And this is the third member of the charismatic pelagic species. This is the Atlantic sailfin. I don't know if any of you have fished for them. They're typically found in more tropical areas, but they're among the fastest fish in the sea and probably one of the most loved fishermen, or fish for fishermen um, from the Carolinas down to South America. And again, the common theme of these species is no matter what their value, you would be amazed at how little we know about their basic biology, their spawning grounds, what they eat, and um, what their annual migration patterns are. So, if you were here last year, I'm giving you a quick sort of uh, profile on who's in charge of bluefin science, or big eye science, and management. The players are under the ICAT framework, framework, the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas. So, Stock assessments for the highly migratory species are conducted by what we call the national scientists that often operate in Madrid. They're member nations that send their scientists to the table and they conduct stock assessments. Occasionally other people attend, NGOs, um, and when we have the funds, we attend as well. But I will point out that of the highly migratory species that are managed, the tunas, the billfish, and the swordfish in the Atlantic, there is no scientific science and statistics advisor committee, unlike in the Hawaiian Islands, the Pacific, the Gulf of Mexico. So for the whole uh, framework of ICAT, in the US, highly migratory species um, science advisory is not conducted in, in, a, in a manner that's similar to other places. So um, the federal managers, the policy advocates, then take the scientific advice and decide what their best policy recommendations will be at the table. As you see here, Ellen Peel is a recreational commissioner. This was Jane Lubchenco, who, who until she moved on from NOAA, was the NOAA head, and Russell Smith, also a NOAA um, um, representative. And so that's how it's done. It's a big framework that's been in place since 1981, I believe. So, you've, you've probably heard me say um, in past, uh, well, just about any species that that's, has stock assessments conducted. In the case of bluefin tuna, are the stock assessments that are based on statistical models describing the population trajectory, um, basically, are they robust? Do they reflect reality? And are the biological assumptions that go into the stock assessments realistic? And that question is very difficult when you have a species that can swim across the ocean and back in the first year of its life. So our view of these species that cover a lot of ground is very much linked to the uh, decades of collection of catch statistics and effort. So we are now knowing that sometimes you need more information than catch statistics to really understand what's going on. Now the other really cool thing about bluefin tuna, as far beyond its sushi value, is that bluefin are some of the most iconic uh, fish in the oceans. You can see they're just beautifully streamlined. The military and the navy has used this body design for submarine and autonomous vehicle design. These are, these are fish that can dive to over 3,000 feet. They maintain a warm body temperature. They're much, much warmer than the ocean that they're found in. They're fast growing. They have the highest metabolic rate of all the fishes and they warm their gut. And that means that they can eat a lot, they can turn over their food, they warm their eyeballs like swordfish, so when they're in cold water or something we think they can still continue to operate, and they warm their eyes, which I just said. So these are um, really a unique 
cold-blooded animal. It's really functioning like a warm-bodied animal. And if you had the luxury of flying in a spotter plane, you could see they're among the most beautiful animals in the sea. They're schooling species, and they're found in schools of upwards of 5,000 individuals. And so there you go. And so this actually, this slide is very iconic. I think it was taken by Freddie Brooks. Here's his plane shadow. Back when, in 1993, the estimate for the Western uh, Atlantic population of adults was 7,000 plus or minus individuals. And in a very short period of time, with our spotter plane surveys, we were able to show to document that the anecdotal feeling that fishermen said that there were more bluefin than was being represented in the stock assessment was absolutely true. And so the nature of our work since 1993 is to deliver better information on how many fish there are using fishery independent approaches and using fishery independent approaches to learn more about the fish themselves. So I would say this is the underlying theme. We want to get to the best information that we can to understand fish that cross the oceans and are found from the surface to over 3,000 feet. So I hope that the bluefin example will give you an idea of the nature and the complexity of management challenges. For the last 25 years, bluefin have been managed as two separate stocks with a di dividing line at 45 degrees west meridian under the assumption that they don't really mix across the management line, that they have separate and exclusive spawning areas in the east and the med, and in the west, presumably in the Gulf of Mexico, and that the mixing rates between these areas is under a couple percent. But these black lines have shown the migration paths of fish that were tracked with just a spaghetti tag. And so for decades, fishermen knew and, and biologists knew that the fish were crossing the management line. But the question is, how much were they crossing? And so you probably heard that there's been vast overfishing in the med for decades orders of magnitude higher than scientific advice of ICAT. There was nothing done about that until the last three years when finally the Eastern Atlantic is in scientific compliance. And I will say that the West has always been in scientific compliance of the Western Stock Assessment uh, Management Advice. So I will also, um, you've heard about the work that we've done in my lab uh, with our collaborators and particularly work done by the graduate students um, and over the last 10 years, we have learned that the biological assumptions that go into the bluefin stock assessment for western bluefin are not supported by our ecological and biological studies. And this is work that the old timers did. Guts, gonads, you know, what they're eating, what are their growth rates, and you can see a lot of our lab uh, members and students contributed to this messy, stinky work, and the fishermen here in this audience and the dealers have assisted us in this work. It's not easy, and it takes a lot of dedication. I would give you just examples of the highlights of what we found out. Now, one of the bases for management of the differences between the East and West Atlantic was that the Western bluefin are magically different than the Eastern bluefin, and that they delay their maturity until they're 8 to 12 years of age. And that's been the assumption for the last 20 years. And that's based on the size of fish in the Gulf of Mexico, where there's a long line bycatch of bluefin while fishermen are targeting yellowfin. And truthfully, that's the extent of the sampling that's been done since the 1960s. So what we look at are the sizes of the gonads versus the weight of the tuna. And we're also looking at the fat that comes with the gonads. And a work done by Gilad Heinisch and Jesse Knapp, who are two Finnish PhDs in my lab, were able to show from profiling done on the, on the gonads in the Western Atlantic um, that some of these assumptions, the assumption of the difference in maturity is simply not supported by biolog biological and reproductive studies. So these, uh, our team collected whole gonads, the fat, muscle, liver, and basically we did the uh, work that you would do, for example, if you were looking at the reproductive status of, of, uh, of a couple that was interested in fertility. And the reason why I think nobody did it over all the years is because it's hard. You, it's very hard to tell what um, condition, sexual uh, reproduction condition a bluefin it is, is in because the gonads go through their stages so quickly. The one way to do it is to take out the pituitary in the brain that is controlling the hormones that drive the maturation phase, just like any other animal, your dog, your cat, or yourself, for example. And so this is an absolutely unambiguous way to define the sexual maturity of a fish. So 
uh, Gilad Heinrich's work was to look at the reproductive hormones, and here I show you the immature fish. This is the follicle stimulating hormone over luteinizing hormone. If you're a woman that's had to deal with your um, endocrine status during pregnancy, you'll know what these are. But um, basically, these show the hormone levels of males and females for fish that are known to be sexually mature, and that's 185 centimeters. And these are the hormone uh, ratio levels for immature fish. And you could see that that ratio is very high and immature. So what Gilad did in his work was examine fish that were under 185 centimeters. And lo and behold, the fish from 134 to 185 centimeters, their endocrine profiles showed that they were resembled and were similar to um, sexually mature fish. And in fact, these ratios established sexual maturity and significantly smaller fish. What that means is that bluefin in the West are maturing at more or less the same rate as they are in the East. This is no surprise to a good biologist or a reproductive physiologist because a fish that grows at the same rate, eats the same food, crosses the Atlantic and back, and mixes with its, its, its fellows, why should they have vastly different reproductive life histories? And this work finally establishes that they don't. Another interesting thing is, because this is considered so shockingly bizarre, you would not believe the resistance to this emerging understanding. And that is, the, the response to um, the lowering the maturity is that, well, all those bluefin must be skipping spawning, because they're not going to the Gulf of Mexico, which I've showed you in previous talks, and you'll see in a minute. Um, but bluefin here, as all bluefin fishermen know, put on up to 10, 15 pounds of fat around their gonads. They leave the feeding grounds with that fat attached to the gonad, and when they get to the spawning grounds, by the time they get there, that fat is entirely gone. That's what it uses to make eggs and the milk, the sperm, that is the reproductive output of bluefin. And by the way, that's a bluefin lunch. So fish come up here to feed, they get fat, their bodies get fat, their gonads get fat. The idea that all of those fish would skip spawning does not fit life history theory. So we think that the evidence supporting uh, fish uh, maturing earlier and not skip spawning is fairly um, substantial. The other reason why we think that western bluefin don't um, either skip spawning or not sexually mature is because, as um, our lab says, skippers should grow faster. These curves compare the growth rate of eastern and western bluefin, and the point is, in the years of life that they're maturing, they're essentially similar. So western bluefin are not doing anything vastly different than the, their, their fellows in the east, and so we still think this is a consistent story. So why does maturity, why is this so important and why is this so controversial? Because the age of maturity is basically the basis of the output of the population. So it matters because fecundity and the age of maturity matters about how many bluefin will be coming up. And that influences stock trajectory. And as I say here, why does it matter so much? Because spawning stock biomass is dependent on getting the age of maturity and the, and the maturing population getting it right. And if you don't have it right, you're missing those age classes that are contributing to the population. They're not being um, included in the assessments. So um, the other thing is that we have to prove that these younger fish are spawning. And we have to find out where they're spawning, and that remains very challenging. And you'll see why in a second. So we've taken our satellite tracks of fish that we've been tagging since 1997 from New England and from Canada, and looking at what their migration or paths are over a year. And from that information, um, we are predicting where bluefin could be spawning in a paper that was presented to ICAT a couple years ago. And we've been trying to get the work done that will ultimately tell us where there could be other spawning areas if they exist, which we very much believe they do. These are just examples of an annual track. Each one of these is a giant bluefin tuna that was tagged off of Canada with our fishermen partners. It's actually uh, Eric Jacquard and the Fin Seeker. And they're examples of the annual migration paths of individual bluefin. As we all know, they're usually swimming with schools. 
And they're just examples of the migration route over a year. Now remember, well, if you were to previous lectures, bluefin tuna are all supposed to leave here after they feed and go to the Gulf of Mexico, where they're supposed to spawn in April and May, and then come back. But only about a third to a half of the fish that we've tagged since 1997 have entered to the Gulf of Mexico, which is why we first developed the hypothesis, well, could they be spawning somewhere else? If we've shown that they're sexually mature and we show that they leave in really good condition, then we believe that there could be other areas for spawning and we are hopefully getting to that question. The satellite tags that you've heard us talk about in the past are uh, basically they're computers. They record depth, temperature, and light levels from the highly resolved information that they're carrying on these tags that pop up and then transmit the information to satellites, which we then get. People like Ben Galloardi, who's sitting there, is an expert on analyzing the data from the tag, including oceanographic information. And for example, what you see is an annual track here for a fish that we released in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. It actually went to the Eastern Atlantic, was over there in the summer, um, no, there, yeah, but it spent a good amount of time, the cooler temperatures are like the winter months and the spring months in the Bahamas before going back up to the Canadian area. So here's its depth record, here's its temperature record over that time, and here's the temperature at its depth. So we really know a lot more about these fish from these tags. So where did that fish spawn, or did it skip spawning? We believe that this area, which is warm enough for larvae to develop, could be a spawning area. So. We have to resort to models when we can't get to the fish. It's very, very hard to get the permit to be or be on a long line or the only people that are out in these areas. But with, this is an output of the CEPA-DIME model that we're working on with our collaborator, Patrick Lahode. And what the colors indicate is the, basically the quality of the habitat for larval development. And this model takes into account oceanographic information and also uh, trophic, uh, basically foods from plankton on up that would support larval development. And if you notice, the known spawning area here in the med is lighting up, but also note that these areas, here's the time, that's, that's October, it's zipping through time, the Gulf of Mexico, the known spawning area is heating up, but there's also areas off of uh, Africa, and at some point in this there's areas off the central North Atlantic. So this is one way to approach a problem when you can't get to the fish. And it's certainly um, encouraging that the results in the known spawning areas are consistent with the model. Now, I'm really excited about this slide. This slide was presented, um, or the information, at the Ocean Sciences meeting in Honolulu in January. I wasn't there, but John Lampkin, who is a NOAA scientist in the Southeast Fishery Science Center, has been conducting larval cruises for bluefin in the Gulf of Mexico for the last 20 years. We finally convinced some people to start looking elsewhere. In 2001, John Lampkin said it was a total waste of time to look anywhere else for bluefin larvae. Happily, we convinced him that he should probably reconsider, and I think he had his own ideas. These blue circles, here's Florida, this is the Gulf Stream, these indicate stations where John Lampkin's team found bluefin larvae. They are in the area that we predicted bluefin are spawning. This is finally, now even though there's only a few bluefin larvae, when they do the bluefin larvae toes in the Gulf of Mexico, they only find a few larvae. Bluefin larvae are hard to find. They swim fast and they don't always show up easily. But what we're finding, for, thank, thank heavens that they're finally looking, that when they're looking in places that we think are good spots for, for larval development, at least for the first time they found them. Now there are some, if you Google my name, and um, a very famous scientist, uh, a, um, a conservation scientist, you will learn that Molly Lutkavich has been pie in the sky in her entire career, the existence of alternative spawning grounds for bluefin tuna. And I'm very happy to say that we are not the only ones that, that use scientific evidence to suggest that we should be looking more broadly about our, our conceptions about blue, bluefin tuna. And it's just the tip of the iceberg. So this shows us that if you look, as they say in French apparently, if you look, you will find. If you don't look, you do not find. So clearly much more needs to be done. And here's our other smoking gun. Um, we had Bart Di Fiore, we sent out on a long liner um, in May in the eastern Bahamas, and they only captured a few bluefin, but um, a number of the bluefin, five out of seven were, you could see this very, that's Bart's foot, very large ovary that was in spawning condition. Now there were no eggs on the deck, 
but we're finally, if you can get to these places, you may find um, the evidence that indicates potential spawning areas. But it, again, it's very hard to do, and this work is no longer funded. So you can see when I mentioned that in the title, the challenges of the work, almost every level is a challenge to get this information. Now, if this is my swan, swan song as far as bluefin tuna uh, seminars, um, which I hope it isn't, I can't help but bring in the ugly truth of the politics of bluefin. Uh, John Hoey is a scientist at the Northeast Center. Um, he's uh, in charge of cooperative research. He said, Molly, you must be a saint. Bluefin is a career wrecker. And ev almost nobody goes into it because it's a career wrecker. The politics of bluefin science and conservation advocacy and the portrayal in the media, as you all know, is a real problem because it's not about scientific consensus. It's about um, opportunities for getting the, the attention. Not to say that there aren't huge concerns about bluefin and all the tunas, uh, particularly bluefins, throughout the world. But if you are a National Geographic magazine subscriber last month, you'll have read a story by Quix, called Quicksilver, where um, despite having interviewed a number of us, National Geo portrays the age of maturity for Western bluefin from 12 to 14 and said that the group that suggested that bluefin mature at a younger age was um, funded by commercial fishermen and we would be, it would be convenient if we found that bluefin were maturing at a younger size. So what I point out is you can't believe everything you read and not only were we not funded by industry since 1993, I would point out that many great cooperative research programs are funded by industry. So please, when you consume this information, even National Geographic, know that there is scientific consensus and peer review out there and you should not believe everything you read. And thank you for letting me get on my soapbox. Um, so, um, so East and West mis mixing, there are other ways to get at this question and the Large Pelagics Research Center, when we had the earmarks and the money, our center funded the groundbreaking studies that I'm going to show you next to get at what, what, what is the nature of the mixing, oh, I don't know what happened here. Um, there we go. What is the nature of the mixing? Nick, uh, mixing studies, of, like how much the, are the fish mixing across the ocean are hard. And here's one of our team basically digging out for the otoliths, the ear bones that are used to get chemical signals. You can do age and growth from ear bones. And you could also look at the chemical signals in them. And the chemical signals tell you about um, the, the water that the fish was swimming in, and particularly they show the record from the, the, from the um, first year of the animal's life. And so these are what we call, I tried to simplify it, biomarker studies. And what the biomarker studies show, this is Jay Rooker and Dave Secor in a study that the center first funded showed that you can distinguish um, different kinds of fish. When they looked at adolescent bluefin in the western Atlantic from the recreational fishery, they found a 60% signal from eastern origin fish in our bluefin recreational fishery landed fish. So this is independent evidence that we, are, we have, um, a, what do they call it, subsidy in the west of bluefin that were born in the Mediterranean or at least the eastern Atlantic. This, um, the second uh, source of information is another biomarker. This was work that our center also f funded. This is our dear friend, and sadly she's passed away, Rebecca Dickett. She used organochlorine or pesticide, pesticide residues to also look at um, the origin, of the natal origin of bluefin using PCB, which was not allowed in the US and was allowed in the Mediterranean. And when Rebecca looked at PCB levels, she found also consistent with a, a microconstituents from 33 to 83% of those juveniles uh, sampled in the West migrated from the East. And so, and, and another form of evidence is an emerging um, uh, power of genetics. Emily Chandler in our lab is a marine geneticist besides being my, our program manager. Um, using microsatellites and basically DNA sequences, um, th these, I'm not sure what that is, it could be a phone. Um, genetic studies are still, they're showing um, significant low but population structure differences between the Gulf of Mexico and the Eastern Mediterranean. And you're lucky you're not my student, because I would have to tell you. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> I'm kidding. I, I'm only kidding. Don't worry. Um, so, but. But the signals so far, the discrimination is not enough to assign origin or Atlantic subpopulations, and so it needs work. But again, Large Pelagics Research Center funded this work ahead of NOAA. And so I'm trying to point out that independent science is sometimes the first to suggest new approaches. And happily, NOAA has gotten behind all of these studies, and so they're following up. And genetics, I think, will emerge as a powerful tool to tell us at least about structure. So to sort of wind it up, I also have to point out the very, very important role of citizen science is sort of the new term. We used to call it cooperative tagging programs. Um, our Tag a Tiny uh, program that uh, many, some of you in the audience, Many, many fishermen, recreational fishermen and anglers, we have over almost 2,000 now, have started tagging uh, a bluefin with a conventional spaghetti tag. They're recording information, and that information is being used to get at the nature of, or the, the degree of mixing, um, information such as estimates of mortality, um, of natural mortality over long term, um, this information is a very, very important part of stock assessment. And lo and behold, we have some of the first exciting information that one-year-old bluefin, which were not known to cross the Atlantic, um, there's a lot of info on this slide, but this is where in the Bay of Biscay, our colleagues and our collaborators um, at ASTI Lab tagged juvenile bluefin one-year-olds in the Bay of Biscay. And the next year, from August through July 3rd, on Long Island, a recreational fisherman caught that fish and return the data information to us. And a couple days or weeks later, I forget, there was another one. So it was not known before that one-year-old bluefin could cross the Atlantic. And so this is contributing, if you remember, that the biomarker studies showed that the Mediterranean, which was never supposed to influence what happened in the West, that's why that management line was down the middle, is now being shown on almost every level of evidence to not be true, that actually there's a great deal of mixing. And we suspect that the mixing rates change radically from one year to the next. So if we measure or assign mixing one year, it's very possible, based on all the other signs, that it changes from year to year. And it might have to do with ocean productivity. Um, for example, we know very little about squid, but we do know that almost uh, most of the time that bluefin are offshore or big eye or swordfish, they are eating squid. We know that from stomach content analysis, but we know so little about squid dynamics. All right, now I'm going to finish up with the, the, the new players in our repertoire. If you watch Sword Life on the Line, this is a big eye tuna. That's Captain Scott Drabinowitz, who is, um, I would say, the Highliner captain. Well, Linda Greenlaw was in there. Scotty has been our tagging partner since 1994 when we actually worked with him on reducing leatherback bycatch. And he figured out, and his partners, how to reduce the gear off leatherbacks. And then Noah took up that program and did a very, very successful sea turtle disentanglement program that was led by the Eagle Eye 2. And Scotty and John uh, Caldwell, the two captains and their crews, have been tagging bluefin and big eye for us, swordfish for Lisa Natanson for quite a long time. And these are the first results of uh, big eye that were tagged in only two locations by the Eagle Eye 2 off Carolinas and some off the uh, canyons. And these tracks, which were um, they just show you the most basic um, tracks um, that was work done by Ben here and Tim Lamb. This is the first annual migration paths of Western Atlantic bluefin. And you can see that some of the bluefin made it far down and are feeding off the Amazon basin. So um, the longliners know this. Some of them go down there. The Pocahontas fishes off Brazil. So until you have a fishery independent tag, you might not know that the, that the big eye that were here were running up and down a pretty narrow zone of the Western Atlantic. And in fact, these are similar to the migration paths of both swordfish and bluefin. So in terms of the challenges of managing the pelagic fisheries, if you want them to avoid bluefin, it's going to be very hard to do because these large pelagic species are running up and down the eastern side of the Gulf Stream. And what is also more telling is that the ICAT um, population information from conventional tags and catches. So, so big eye distributed over here. So even though there's only a few tags, we kind of stole these tags as they were rebuilt and we did it basically on the um, good graces of the Eagle Eye 2 and our own, uh, let's call it craftiness. 
Um, the real question is, if we were able to tag Big Eye throughout the Atlantic, what would we see? And uh, a gut instinct is that we are going to see the kinds of migration diversity that we saw in bluefin tuna. But this is the only data that ICAT has, or will have, fishery independent movements. And if you remember the bluefin data, for these fish we also have the depth and the temperature patterns. If there's any um, fishermen that are looking for a bluefin, or sorry, big eye, I can't help it. Um, this is the depth and the date pattern. And unlike bluefin, big eye are like clocks. This is really cool. It shows that their diving patterns are so regular. They're down here foraging. You can talk to Ben about this. And the warmer temperatures show that they come up to the surface waters and they warm up. And I think we have some more here. These are individual big eyes that you just saw the tracks for. And you can see the diversity of diving patterns and the temperature, um, the colors indicate, you know, cold is cold and or blue is cold and red is warm. That's the kind of information that we can get by using electronic tags that are very expensive and that cost $4,000 a piece. But for the first time, you have fishery independent information. Now, my last um, example of the kinds of things that we could do now, um, here's the pop-up satellite tag that we've talked about in the past. This is work, um, actually, Emily and I, um, with our fishermen partners, Anthony Mandillo and Isla Mujeres, Eric Jacquard, Ben Galloardi has the lead on the paper. Um, we worked with Guy Harvey Foundation, and believe it or not, Sir Richard Branson bought six of our tags. We wished he bought the whole lab, but we haven't gotten there yet. Um, but we're very excited that using what we've learned from tuna, we figured, let's see if we could beat everybody on keeping that tag on a sailfish. And using our methods and um, our fisherman partner, we were able to keep these tags on for up to, actually next week, they're scheduled to pop off after being on the sailfish for a year. And so this record, this is for me to um, show you just a short clip, if I can. Emily's gonna be telling me to, I always, give me one second um, to miniaturize, Oop, go back. I'm going to end the show, if you'll bear with me. I'm technically challenged, as they all know, in my lab. Come on. Oh, Emily, that, that, there we go. Ruben and Eric stand by to help wrangle the fish on the boot. That's the voice of Guy Harvey. We want to tag it as quickly as possible to avoid stress on the fish. There's Ruben. Pena, he's our mate. That's Eric Jacquard, our bluefin captain in Canada. Once on board, a water hose provides salt water to allow the sailfish to breathe. Its eyes are covered to help keep it calm, and Molly looks for the perfect place to tag the fish. She'll put the tag in the thick part of the fish's flesh right under the front. That was our first sailfish, that's why it took us so long. Ready? Ready? Guys in the water. Obviously, we're here with a crew of experts that know selfish really well, yourself included. And we always look for robust fish that have absolutely no injury. We can get the fish safely off the deck in really 30 seconds. And the other thing is we take every precaution, patting the deck, having a hose in its mouth, and we're very careful about where we place the tank and the jar. So I think we're doing everything as, in the most optimal way. And the goal is that you've done such a good job putting it in a good spot with lots of tissue and muscle that keeps the tag in place, but the tissue heals, and then over time you even have a more uh, better chance of keeping the tag in longer. I watch it as it swims away, followed by other fish from the same school. All right, so here's a taste. This is emerging data. Um, this is uh, the plot. Basically, these, we tag these fish off Cancun, Isla Mujeres, where Anthony runs um, his, his charter operation. And again, you're used to seeing the tracks now. There's the Gulf of Mexico. And they represent the migration paths of Atlantic sailfish for quite a long time. And of course, we ask the questions, where are they spawning? Um, you know, what, what is basically the nature of their whole life history? Uh, believe it or not, their spawning areas are assumed, but no one's really looked at them. So again, this is emerging information, the first time it's been done, and these are just a few species. And so for my wind-up, I just wanted to point out that we're very proud of the last 20 years of our contributions as independent fishery scientists, of our cooperative 
cooperative partnerships with NOAA, of our cooperative partnerships with many fishermen, and many, many collaborators in both Europe um, and Canada. Um, and I would be remiss to um, not tell you that we really hope you go to our website, go to our Facebook page, and look at what we're doing. But this is the reason why I'm here tonight, and that is to, to quote Sir Richard Branson. Every great movement in the world starts with a tiny group of people who simply refuse to accept a situation. And I know you might recognize Thelma and Louise in the car. I thought that was Emily and I. But um, we've tried very hard. But the Large Pelagics Research Center, for the most part, is now down to um, the end of the line. We no longer have federal funding to function past this summer. Um, we have, do, are working very hard to retain staff, but we haven't won that battle because clearly all our young, talented people who are scooped up by the first people because they're so good at their jobs. Unfortunately, I face, as a lab director, potential closure of our lab. And I'm just being honest, we, are, we tried very hard to build it here at UMass at the Marine Station. And we are not, at this point, sure that we're going to function past the summer as we have been, as Large Pelagic's lab. The center is essentially something that we were with grad students, but right now, because of all the challenges to many independent labs, such as ours, uh, we're not funded by UMass as far as our salaries. We're there, um, but it's very, very much a challenging situation at a time when basically many of us are forced to look at private philanthropy. Um, if you've heard about the Schmitz and the Schmidt Ocean Institute, it's just the way it is right now that federal funds earmarks are over or at least very, very much diminished and labs like mine are really faced with um, potentially either closing or morphing into something else. And so uh, I don't want to be entirely pessimistic. I looked at Sir Richard's uh, uh, words here because we'd really love to get Sir Richard to buy more than six tags. And uh, we'd be very happy if any of you would like to introduce me to any other philanthropist of the nature of Sir Richard. But again, I thank you all for being supportive of us, for the Bluefin and the other fishermen that have had our backs as far as telling Congress that they liked what we were doing, our NOAA partners that I hope enjoyed that the science that we put on the table. And um, I guess I'll end there. And I would also particularly, let's see if I can get that to go, oops, slideshow. Um, sorry, I want to make sure that you see our people. Um, I would also like to thank all of my grad students, our postdocs, and Ben Galuardi, who's been my longest staff member. I would like to thank them all for all of their contributions to the large pelagic uh, science. And um, I hope you've enjoyed what we've been able to uh, do the past few years here. And I'll take a few questions. Yes, we will. Thanks, Ellen. And Ellen's, by the way, a friend of ours and a beautiful artist. Um, uh, we, are, we are recording and they will be posted, but you have to go to the Facebook page because uh, websites are hard to update. And you don't have to be a Facebook member, so you just have to click, go to our website, and the, um, let's see if I can get it up. There it is, uh, tunalab.org, and up on the here, if you click on this area here, it will take you to our Facebook. And sooner or later, we'll get them up there. When the eyes of the big guy are warm, is that by the blood that's flowing through the veins? And does the blood uh, temperature vary as a function of the water temperature around it? It's, it's actually the bluefin and swordfish and poor beagles that heat their eyes. So the big eye, at least not to my knowledge, doesn't heat it. But you're right, it's the vasculature around the eyes. It's a special reets. They call it a, a reet mirabile. Um, so they, they basically keep the, um, the warmth of that, whatever, it's the head muscles, they, they are able to keep their eyes warmer than the exterior of their heads. Why does a one-year-old tuna cross the Atlantic? <laughs> That's, yeah. <laughs> 
I want. Uh, they apparently, it's a very. I mean, we don't. We don't know other than there's, as we all know, there's three things that that bluefin and anything else likes: food, sex, and good memories. So if it's too young to to uh, to be spawning, which of course they are, we're saying they're not mature until they're at least four or five. Um, we presume it comes over here to feed on herring, mackerel, actually small fish, it's sand lance, and and probably other things, krill. Yeah, that's what I was, because uh, my real concern and guilt is over the fact that uh, eating uh, fish oil in the morning for vitamin, <laughs> I'm destroying the, the uh, food chain uh, and, and that all of these yeah. larger, uh, more vital, you know, food stuffs are dependent on it. And, and I'm wondering if, if, if ultimately with, the, with global concerns, this is where your, your, what your research is, is leading up to some, somehow uh, come to some comprehensive sense of, of how fragile and, and interdependent everything is, hopefully. Uh. You're right, and I, I, I can't answer that question about the state of, but I can tell you, I know there's a lot of fishing pressure, pressure on Antarctic krill for those reasons, and I know colleagues that work in the Antarctic are very concerned about overfishing there because of the impact on the upper trophic level. So I'm sure there's a, there's a tipping point somewhere where we, you could um, do damage, absolutely. Question. Do you think the spawning grounds have always been out of the Gulf of Mexico, or do you think climate change has influenced the new spawning grounds that you're seeing? Um, that's a good question. Actually, I think it was Tim Lamb in our lab. I mean, if you actually look at geological time, they couldn't have always spawned there because, of course, it wasn't always there. And bluefin are older than the Gulf of Mexico. And so um, we don't know. And truthfully, the Gulf of Mexico we know is a spawning ground because there's a fishery operating there and they catch fish that are ripe. Um, and we're not looking. They, no one was expecting to see bluefin spawning anywhere else, except the old timers, Frank Mather, Pete Wilson, they said that bluefin spawn off the canyons. Um, famously, uh, Frank Mather said, probably rightly, that bluefin are spawning across space and time, that smaller bluefin spawn closer to the foraging grounds because you know they basically don't have the energy of large, fat, old tuna. And so, actually work done in my lab by Eric Chapman, uh, who was our postdoc at the time, did a life history model that, consistent with cod and other migratory species, predicted that smaller fish would spawn closer to where they feed. And that seems to be a good, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, um, a reasonable assumption. So we can't answer specifically. And believe me, there are many people that still say they don't believe it. But I hope I could show you that we believe that as good scientists, there is building evidence and what we would call the most parsimonious story to explain why only a portion of giant bluefin every year or sexually mature tuna go to the Gulf of Mexico. We don't believe that a half of the population of fit, capable tuna would choose not to spawn. We don't think climate change, particularly if they're physically capable. Um, so that's what it comes down to. But what happened over history, I mean, we can barely tell what's going on now. So it's a good question, but it, we can't answer it. I'm going to go to the back. Is it, is it possible that all of these live fish use the same spawning grounds, or are they territorial, aggressive? Well, uh, different species, uh, a number of the tunas, like the warm, warm tunas, the skipjack, yellowfin, even big-eyed, they spawn over really large areas and they spawn, and some of them spawn all year. They're just, they, they have shorter lives. So um, it's not a big deal where they spawn because it's almost everywhere all the time. It's the more temperate tunas like bluefin that um, seem to really cut their spawning uh, to a cer certain period of time. Um, so, but it's all about the larvae. It's about what the larvae need. Bluefin can go anywhere at any time, it seems. So uh, the, one would think that the tuna has to be good enough to pick the right spot so that its larvae develops and has enough food and has the right temperature and not too many predators. And maybe that's hard to find. Um, we just don't know. And we also presume that bluefin are schooling and there might be also a density dependence so that, you know, you, if you don't have a partner, 
it's not good, you're not going to get anywhere with your spawning activity. So um, there's also a question of what triggers spawning if, if, when the fish is ready it, physiologically, and is there a minimum number of fish that would actually induce uh, reproduction in some way or another? And there's some evidence coming from captive bluefin, from the Japanese, from work done in the med, that I think we're going to get to some of this information sooner or later. Question? Has there been any um, evidence or studies done in the Gulf regarding the um, spawning with the oil spill affecting the, uh, you know, the fry? Yeah, there's been, um, I'm just checking our time, uh, there's been two studies right after the spill. There were models that looked at the known spawning area, they looked at the area of the Gulf horizon, and they calculated from 10 to 20 percent of the known spawning area was affected by oil. Now, if you believe that all bluefin spawn in the Gulf of Mexico, you could understand why some, um, some uh, conservation scientists were saying that the 2010 year class was wiped out. I would say the scientific consensus didn't agree with that. And that, um, and particularly because we believe that only a portion of bluefin that were spawning, even in the Gulf, would have encountered the horizon area. Now, I know you heard that it was in the news, there's been a study that if you oil larvae, of course, it seemed pretty obvious to us that if you oil larvae and eggs, you know, they're not going to do very well. And so, of course, I guess they needed the evidence for BP to prove that if you oil an egg, it's going to die. Um, so, absolutely. The real question, though, is I personally think that there are other issues. Uh, for the first time in my 20 years of looking at hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bluefin. We're seeing tissue pathologies I never saw before. We're seeing parasites I never saw before. Uh, at least fairly obvious things, and I don't know if fishermen here have noticed it, but um, it doesn't mean that the, you know, if Gulf Horizon didn't knock them out, there aren't threats to the health of animals in the sea. And believe me, um, there's almost no work done on this. Other than Gulf Horizon, very few scientists anymore look at health. So I would, if I had money, I would like to document what's going on in bluefin, what the pathology is. Is it related to Gulf Horizon? It's hard to see. I'm more concerned about warming, about um, other um, infectious processes. I would really like to know what's going on in bluefin in the Western Atlantic, if, it's, if, if in fact it's related um, to anything else going on in the ecosystem. Do you see those changes? Throughout the, all the populations that you study, or are those parasitizations and so on, more in one area than another? Well, Hazel, I'd have to say she's our next door neighbor. I would have to say that um, we, the, the, we have so few observations, I wouldn't go out on a limb at all. And I'm not a pathologist, so we don't even know the nature of the pathologies yet. We have them submitted to a VIMS expert, and, and we have an undergraduate student, um, Zoema Warshawski, who's decided she wants to become a parasitologist. She's so enamored of parasites and bluefin tuna. So uh, we're psyched, psyched that maybe Zoema will be the person that tells us what's going on. And I do hope to find funding to look at the pathology once we figure out, basically with our VIMS collaborators, can we figure out what it is first, and then we'll go from there. So thanks. Any questions? Thanks, everybody, and come back next Thursday. Right, one more announcement real quick. Um, I'm sorry about any confusion about the pre-registering. We're going to get that started out. And by Monday, we'll have um, some sort of announcement on our Facebook page. I'll also send it out to um, the, our email list. Um, so either go to that, go to our um, website or our Facebook page. You don't have to be a member of Facebook to get to it. And uh, we'll clear that up so that for anyone coming to the future ones, there will that confusion will not occur again. So thank you very much for coming. <laughs>